So I'm going to go ahead and start letting people into the room since it's um, four o'clock. Are you okay with that? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, cool. Um, we currently have five people in the waiting room um, and there's 10 people signed up for this session. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if only five people showed up just because generally like our metric is the number of people who show up like half that number sorry the number of people who register half the, uh, of that number is like who actually shows up Fair enough. so hi people who are coming in hi everyone I don't know why it doesn't seem that way. Y'all, hey just so you know, um, the meeting is being recorded. Um, it may or may not be posted to our YouTube channel, but just so you know, it's being um, it's being recorded. Um, we can maybe wait just like a minute or two, um, but just in case this is your first session with us, uh, this is Wednesday on the Soup. It's a weekly. Um, one hour long program. I am also on a sidewalk right now, so I do apologize for the loudness. I'm going to be on mute for most of the session, so don't worry about my background noise. Um, but we will be here next week as well with Wednesday on the Stoop um, with members from the Authors Guild talking about advances. So you can mark that in your calendar if you're interested. But Norm, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you and mute myself. <laughs> Um, hi, so my name is Noor, I use she, her pronouns, and I want to get to know all of you um, as we kind of have this conversation. So if you feel comfortable just like saying your name and pronouns and just where you're zooming in from, and just if something's on your mind, you can say that too, I guess, that's fine. Um, so yeah, just name and pronouns, where you're zooming in from, and where your mind is at if you want. Um, I'll start. I'll put that in the chat too so people can see what I'm asking you to introduce yourself with. Um, and then after we do that, I'll just kind of introduce my thoughts around the workshop. I think that in hindsight, the way I posed it was a little misleading, but it'll still be fun, I promise. Or it'll be fun to hate on it if you don't like what I do instead. So, you know, whatever we end up doing. So uh, for intros, I want you to do your name, pronouns, Current location is your head today. Sorry, there's no apostrophe. I'm not going back. My name is Noor. I use she, her pronouns. I'm zooming in from West Philly. And my head today is, I guess it's just a little sore. Like I had a headache earlier. I think I didn't drink enough water. Um, so I'm just feeling kind of like blah about that. But I'm pretty excited to do this workshop with y'all. I'm trying something a little new today with it. So this should be fun. Um, Sarah Davis, would you go next, please? Uh, sure. My name is Sarah. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm zooming in from my basement in South Philly, uh, joined by one of my elderly cats on the couch behind me, and, uh, and my head is really unfocused today, so I'm looking forward to walking through some, um, some steps to kind of focus and quiet my mind with you guys. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Lord, will you go next? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Lourdes. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm um, zooming in from Center City here in Philly from my bedroom. And where my head is at, um, I guess a little disappointed, but also tired. I have all these plans for the week and I'm very behind. Uh, so I feel like I need to just accomplish something. I feel you, thank you for sharing that with us. Sorry, I mispronounced your name the first time. Oh, no, no worries. Thank you. Erin, will you go next, please? Yeah, um, my name is Erin. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm currently in Arizona. I recently moved here from Philly, and I think my head is um, still in Philly. I really miss Philly and the East Coast. Um, and I actually found out that I'm allergic to multiple plants and trees that are native to Arizona. So I really um, feel like I should not be living here. I'm sorry, that sounds really stressful. Um, I have a lot of allergies too, so I feel you. Um, thank you for sharing that though. Um, people who just came in, we're just doing an intro, so I put the I put their prompts in the chat again. Um, Corinne, will you go next, please? Yeah, so my name's Corinne Hughes. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. 
and I'm zooming in from Portland, Oregon. Someone in my Instagram feed posted about this and I was like, this looks great, I'm there. Um, yeah, so I'm just in my place over here and I don't know, I'm just trying to be present. Just be here now. Word, thank you for that. Um, Cabria put theirs in the chat or hers in the chat because she's going around, so that's totally fair. Um, Aaron, where did Jessica, do you want to um, answer the intro prompt for us? Sure. Um, I'm Jessica. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I'm currently in Istanbul, but I'm from Philly. Um, so I've been following Blue Stoop. Um, this is the first time I actually was able to attend a class, so I'm excited. Um, so I guess where my head is at is that I'm excited. Um, yeah, I'm ready for this. Um, yeah, that's what's up. Cool. Thank you for the energy. Um, do you have a relationship to Istanbul too? Um, I came here the first time like nine years ago, like my first time ever leaving the country. And I like kind of come back every once in a while because I miss it. I'm glad you're able to go. That's awesome. Uh, Jean, do you want to introduce yourself? Are you trying to just, you can, but you're muted. I don't know if this is your choice. Yeah, I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Jean, she, her pronouns. Um, I work for Bella Stoop and I'm coming to you from a sidewalk on in South Philly. So it's a little loud, but it is nice to be outside because I've been in an office all day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, today is Wednesday on the Stoop. I thought I would lead on this book that I read and was really interested in. It was called, it's called Underworld Lit by Srikanth Reddy. Has anyone here read it or read parts of it? That's great, I kind of love that. Okay, so when I feel like this is like pressure to introduce it in a way that's not biased. I mean, I'm not gonna do that, it's gonna be biased. Um, so I, this is basically a book of prose poetry. So all of the, you know, all the things look like this, most of them. Um, but this person did intend it to be read as poetry, right? And so I, you can talk about like how genre is kind of like, I think of it, I think of genre as kind of partially, especially in today's like world of experimentation and cross genre writing, I consider genre to be like largely author dictated and, and for that decision to be a part of craft. Like when you tell somebody, for, for example, there's a book by a local poet named Caleb Ray Kendrilly. There are this poem that's like a memoir in verse and they say it's a memoir in verse. So you're not reading it as strictly a poetry collection. They're literally being like, this is about my life. And that's a, you know, in poetry often like, has anyone ever like had a, had like questions about like the relationship between your speaker in your writing versus you? And what were the questions that came up if you did have those questions? Also, this is okay if you're, if you're answering the question not as a poet, that's fine. If you write in the first person. Has anyone ever had questions about that come up? I have. What was the question that came up for you? Apologies for my plum. Um, <laughs> am I leaning too much on this speaker? Am I need am I leaning too much? Um, am I staying true to the story I'm trying to tell, or is my own personal stuff leaning in on that too much? Um, am I being authentic, or am I trying to protect this narrator? Um, those are a few questions. Yeah. So what genre are you were you writing in the first person and when those questions came up? Oh, trick question. Um, I think it was because I'm so noncommittal when it comes to genre. Um, it was a short story. But I don't now in hindsight, I don't know if it should have been a short story. I think it maybe should have been something else. And that's why I was grappling so much. But it was a short story. Yeah, actually, can we back up a little bit? Because I forgot this is like a multi-writer space. So can we actually just talk about a little bit about genre and like how your writing practice or reading practice relates to it? Like, what are what do you consider? Like, when do those kind of questions come up around genre or like what you're writing or what you're reading? When do those questions come up for you if they do at all? You can just popcorn it. You can just Oh, I'll jump in since uh, you mentioned prose poetry earlier, and that's something that uh, interests me a lot right now. I'm really more of a nonfiction writer, um, but I've been kind of exploring fiction, and I've been exploring writing nonfiction in more kind of poetic styles, and what I come up with with that uh, tends to be like really short flash 
creative nonfiction that I'm like, is this a prose poem? I don't know. How would I know? <laughs> so that's one way that genre come, comes up for me lately. Yeah, prose poetry, you know, which is kind of loosely defined as like poetry that doesn't rely primarily on like line breaks. It's kind of weird and a strange genre, but like, you know, it's kind of poetry that's written to kind of like, you know, formally it's not doing a lot of the line break stuff. It's meant to be read as if it's like one chunk of prose, but it's still calling itself poetry. Why do you think this can be Sarah or somebody else. Why do you think someone would like intentionally label their poetry that way? Or like write in that way that it's meant to be read as a block of text and not like uh, broken lines. Do you have any ideas about why, when that would make sense or like why that, why, why that might be a decision someone made or have you made that decision before? I definitely wanna hear what other people have to say about that. But I think for me, um, it changes the, the internal voice I use to read um, a poem or a piece of prose, like I just hear it in my head a little different if someone has told me this is a poem or a prose poem or a memoir or some other some other genre. That's interesting. Can you describe the difference in the voices that you read it in? Um, Qualify them? I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I guess maybe the best way to, to explain it is um, when I have switched between genres, like when I was teaching and I would, you know, switch from doing my reading to reading a paper, I would still have the like literary voice from doing my reading in my head while I was reading the students' papers. And it was coming across really like, you know, uh, you know, meaningful and thoughtful, but it was not always. <laughs> I was just hearing it that way in my head and I would have to kind of go back and, and rethink it. So um, it's, it's one of the reasons why with shorter pieces, I try to read them out loud because it, it's, uh, it's otherwise hard for me to, um, you know, get the right tone. That's interesting because it kind of sounds like you're like kind of, you know, consciously or subconsciously maybe you're assigning like, like levels of elevation to different genres. Like, you know how like there's like high lyric and there's like the the voice that people like the reading voice when someone's doing an academic reading versus like a it kind of sounds like you kind of almost like have like a social cultural association with genres. So that I sounds think that's different? fair to say. And I also think that's an impulse I should push back against. So I'm I'm glad that we named it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's like, I think that's a thing that everyone does, or at least has been exposed to, right? Because that's very deep in the literary world that people do that anyway. That's so interesting, though. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, anybody else have, like, thoughts about, like, when does genre come up for you as you're reading or writing? Like, when does that matter, if it matters to you? Sometimes I use prose poetry to challenge myself because, oh, I'm sorry, Erin, you can go next. Oh, no, it's okay. Um, Please finish. I was going to say, I just, I struggle with like lineation as a thing, actually. Like, I feel like sometimes I don't really know like when or why. Sometimes I do it without intention after I go edit it. And it's like, I think prose poetry feels like a challenge because it's so much more reliant on like how it sounds to kind of make those breaks and like those pauses. Like, you know, the only pauses are when like a line breaks wherever you set the margin or like, you know, if there's like a natural pause that you can like build into the language. It also, of course, is dependent on how somebody speaks, right? Because two people don't even read the same meter sometimes. Um, but it's like, you know, I think about like as a challenge to kind of like, if I don't have this kind of tool to rely on, how else can I make like pauses and like emphasize certain, you know, um, certain like words or certain sounds? Like, how can I do that if I don't have line breaks? You know, can I use punctuation? Can I use say sure? Like, can I make, make a pause with a, a, a white space on the line that would be in an intuitive spot? I can make literal space that way, but you kind of have to like think a little bit differently about those things. So maybe sometimes I use it as a, con a constraint and less of like a genre like that form because I think sometimes yeah. the thing that makes me feel weird about prose poetry is that like it kind of prescribes genre terms to a what is actually a form of poetry like form you know thinking about like form a form of poetry meaning like there are constraints that tell you how it's going to show how the language is going to show up on the page like you know a sound is a form that has 14 lines and a turn here and a turn there um and meter and you know this is kind of really I think this is more of a form right and then like people kind of um, add this lens of genre to that, which I find interesting. Yeah, I was just gonna say that um, I think of genre as like a way of framing what kind of lineage you're bringing into the way you read a piece. So like, I don't know um, if anyone's familiar with um, Roxane Gay's collection of short stories, Aidi, um, but it's, like a very densely lyrical, I think she calls them vignettes, but they're like these very brief sort of 
um, short stories, flash fiction. Um, and I think like to situate them as fiction rather than um, prose poems, for example, speaks to, I think like maybe like the writer's own sort of like conceptions of themselves like as a writer of fiction versus as a like a writer of poetry. Um, and yeah, I think like that to name that um, has really shaped like how I come to that text, for example, and who I, what writers I'm like thinking of in conversation with um, pieces like those. I really like love, and that really resonates with me. So thank you for like that. Like that felt like I was like, yeah, that, I've never said it that way, but that's the way I like I've, I've thought about it before. So thank you for that. Okay, I so think I that's actually interesting because you brought up Roxanne Gay and I just finished Hunger and I, I love her. I want her to adopt me. Um, but that's a memoir and she does the same thing. And it was very reminiscent to House on Mango Tree. But I don't know if Sandra Sanera says that that's a memoir the way Roxanne Gay says it's a memoir. And it always makes you feel like, are you allowed to do a vignette if it's a memoir or if it's a creative nonfiction? But then it brings me back to, we're allowed to do whatever we want. So I think in the same way with um, poetry and verse, it's like, am I allowed to do this this way? This is poetry, but then you're like, I'm allowed to do whatever I want as long as it can be the same intent. Because I do think sometimes certain genres convey a certain intent, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I think so. I think we're kind of saying the same thing, right, about like the fact that people will kind of start to like act like genre has certain craft necessities, right? You're, what you're saying is the same thing I just said about prose poetry. You just said like, you know, is it a memoir? In a memoir form, can I do vignettes? It's like vignettes are not a genre. They're like a, they're, they're a structure. Like they're, they're like a, they're a thing that is a way you can convey information in writing. And they're associated heavily, right, with like fiction um kind of creative nonfiction but like you know they, that's like a thing that is not intuitive because we have these kind of borders that are drawn and they're not necessarily actually like there's conventions right um a couple of things that people were saying maybe think about um this poem that uh is like in the beginning of invasive species by marwa Hilal. um but it's it's interesting in terms of like what does the prose poem form allow you to do that uh, poems with traditional line breaks um, would do because it's called poem for Brad who wants me to write about the pyramids and the way that uh, she broke it up it's like um, it's a paragraph but it also leaves space in the middle which almost makes it look like a page in a textbook or like in a newspaper or something like he's getting the report but not the one he asked for because what he asked for was uh, foolishness. Um, so I think that that's interesting. I also, it also, before I thought of that, it made me think about how when I use prose poems, I'm usually um, trying to tell a story or be more descriptive or informative or kind of like thorough, more thorough than I would expect myself to be in a poem with traditional line breaks. So I think it, there are certain allowances that a prose poem versus prose um, what allow you to do like I don't feel like I have to follow grammar so much if it's a prose poem but even um, like genre in my own writing when I'm just just writing prose not a prose poem or anything people still end up telling me that my uh, prose is lyrical so then it feels like I'm never really getting away from poetry because I um, poetry is the first thing I wrote so it all my voice kind of always ends up like that, which I think is interesting when we talk about crossing genres. Thank you for sharing all that. I just wanted to show people the poem that uh, she was talking about, because I just have, this is like, it's a big block of text and she took out this part. And it's basically, you know, it's framed around a narrative as an account of something that she went through in grad school being an Egyptian American person. It's like, you know, Brad was basically her classmate was like, you should write more about Egypt and that's the pyramids and shit. And she was just like, you're dumbass. That's the poem. Um, so it's like, it's yeah, I, I think a lot of these things like are really, what you're saying kind of reminds me of how like poetry is always visual in my opinion. Like 
you know, there's visual poetry that's kind of like the experiment, you know, again, cross genre, it's like making a visual art and making poetry and kind of, you know, blurring that line. But like, you think about it, like, you know, any poetry, it makes like, you know, long lines versus short lines have a different effect because they take up different amounts of space on the page. If the page is full of like, you know, think about like that poem song by Bridget Begin Kelly. Have y'all read that poem? It's like every poetry one of one class, they just be like, read this poem. No, but it's actually really good. But it's like, she has these very long lines. And so I remember when I was handed the, the, you know, this PDF, I was just like, this is like a lot of text. <laughs> and I was just like, this is like a long, and it's long. So it's just like a lot of text versus like, you know, the same, like, you know, if a two page poem had lines that instead of being this long on the page were this long, it looks narrow. Like it literally shows you a different path. Like, you know, um, so I really like that you brought up kind of like what she did with the visual here, like taking out that little chunk in the middle and just like, you know, how it ends up looking like a kind of page that you might see in a textbook that was like a really, um, I like that, thank you. Um, so I do want to kind of get to the, the book that I was talking about, but it kind of, it helps me to kind of hear what y'all kind of have ideas around genre. And if you want to keep bringing those up or bringing them into the conversation, you totally can. Um, I hope this will be natural and cumulative, but I want to just show you um, a few passages from this book. And this is a good transition because I decided not to scan them. Um, I'm just gonna read them and I want you to just listen to me. Um, if you like, I can also link you to like other examples of truth person's work online if you want to at your own pace kind of read some excerpts of it. Um, but I want to just try this today where I'm just going to read it. Um, and I'm going to read two different prose poems from this book. How it's structured it overall as a manuscript is there a couple of different like like parallel universe type of vibes. It's like there's a couple of different threads that are in different completely different world contexts. One of them is um, a story of like Chen the magistrate who basically like got pulled, I guess it's kind of like he got pulled across the earth into like some, somewhere in South America or Central America. And he has to like navigate the underworld um, in that context, literally the underworld of where he's from. He's from, he's, in, like, he's somewhere in ancient uh, China and he gets pulled to another time, but also across the globe. And then there's also this professor who's like battling um, depression and um, work stressors. So I'm gonna read, I'm gonna focus on the story of Chen um, in these couple excerpts that I read you. And as I'm, as I'm, I'm reading the first one, as you hear it, I want you to just like take note of any image or sound. Um, so image meaning like anything sensory in this that stands out to you, that can be any sense. Um, and I also want you to pay attention to, if you notice um, anything about my pace, I'm gonna try to read this as I naturally would. Um, so just if you notice anything about like, just how, how the pacing of this story affects um, how it impacts you. We're gonna do a couple of these. So it's okay if you kind of like feel confused for the first one. Um, but yeah, okay. This is 20, um, 17. When Chen came to his senses, the boys were kneeling at his side, wearing worried expressions. Up close, he now saw that one child appeared to be suffering from some sort of skin condition. It brought to mind the inky rosettes on a spotted jaguar. Otherwise, the boys were mirror images of one another. The remains of a cooked fire glowed at the edge of the clearing. The twins told Chen that they'd, fin they'd fished him from the river and carried him to their camp high in the mountains. He'd lain there, coughing up blood through the night. How he could follow any of this was a mystery to Chen. Something, he sensed, was translating inside his head. The boys reported seeing a dripping staircase emerge from the river, only to disappear into thick jungle along the far shore. Which way did it go? Chen asked in broken quiche. The twins shrugged in unison. They offered Chen a handful of river snails, which he swallowed hungrily. Then they told him about their father, an unemployed weaver, who had disappeared during the recent upheavals in the region. We're going to find him, the twins announced in unison, even if it kills us. A howler monkey roared like an air raid siren somewhere in the fog. What about me? asked Chen. You're coming too, the boys replied, pressing a rusted machete into his hand. So that's the first, that's, that's one of the poems like in the first section of the book. Um, what are, can you drop in the chat like just some of the images that stuck out to you? Trying not to cuss. Oh. Sorry. 
Jaguar, rusted machete, inky rosettes like a leopard. Howler monkey roared like an air raid siren. Yeah, that was the line. So I like how like almost all of these are phrases. Like a lot of y'all were catching on to like interesting phrases that this author used, like or like descriptions that are like kind of more than one word. And then I like I think that Jaguar stood out to me too, Cabria, when I first read this. I was like, that was just so unexpected to me. You know what I mean? It kind of just like I think it jumped out there because it was so like I was wasn't expecting that, you know? The stare with the blood dripping. Yeah, that was because it's just like why, again, why is that there if we're in the jungle? There's like stare, like what does that mean? Right. Um yeah, nice, rusted machete. Um, and what was the question? Oh yeah. Did um did the way how would you characterize my pace as I read? Like, how would you describe that? Or how did it how did it feel to listen? How did, what did the words feel like washing over you? How would you describe that experience? I feel like someone in another class told me that it was overwhelming. They were just like, it was a lot of images and just kind of just kept coming. I was like, I can see that. Um, if it helps to frame the prompt that way for the second reading, like thinking about like how does it feel to listen to this instead of focusing on pace, it enhanced the dialogue. What do you mean by that? Like I felt that um, maybe I'm wrong, but I felt like there were moments like two people were talking to each other, and I felt in that in those moments like uh, the pace like really um, uh, supported that, and like I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, that was like I think that's like a really it's interesting, like, that there's a literary dialogue in these poems that are, like, written, like, these little chunks of text. And, like, you know, the idea that, like, even one of these universes is actually just, this universe about Chen is actually a story that the other guy is translating in the other part of the brain of this book. So the ways that this book starts to come together are really interesting to me. But, yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to read one more, and then I'm going to show you one other excerpt with, like, a link. Um, so you can kind of see one of them that is not in this prose format. Um, so, okay, this is a lot. Here's the second one. Remember the same question. So images that stick out to you and how, like, how it feels as you're listening to this, like describe some of the words. Okay. That night, the twins put on a show for the villagers. Chen watched from a wobbly stool in the front row. Some sort of fermented pink liquor was passed around in a hollow gourd. Low in the sky, a full moon polished everything silver. The boys danced on stilts like drunks in high marsh grass. One shook a rain stick wearing an armadillo mask. The other dressed in, as a whippoorwill, blew into a flute carved from bone. Everybody clapped in time, as if by magic the gourd kept reappearing in Chen's hands. With a flourish, the spotted boy unsheathed his machete, looking up to the sky. Opening wide, he slid the blade down his throat. Chen retched in sympathy, but soon recovered himself. Deep in the foliage, the crickets and rain frogs resumed their pulsating whistle. I love Popova, definition, edition, trans, uh, headlock, trans, which is like, this is like, these are like notes about translation because this guy is an idiot. Um, so he's kind of like intentionally inserting these academic languages, um, you know, phrases and like citations and stuff like that into the, the other narrative. Um, next, the twins set fire to the schoolhouse, jugular bulging, the constable howled in the moonlight. Burning papers fluttered out like hurt birds from the window. A storm lantern exploded with a fiery pop. Then the load-bearing joinery began to show through, lift from within, until the whole affair was reduced to blazing lacework. At last, the roof caved in, followed by the walls, leaving only a spidery door frame full of smoke. It was too much for the children, who were led away in tears. Now it was time for the night's final act. The boy with the jaguar spots dropped to his knees. His brother lay on the ground before him, eyes rolled back, looking inward. With a swift, fluid motion, the kneeling boy plunged a hand into his brother's chest withdrew a dripping fist and brandished it like a fishmonger advertising the day's catch. Rise up, the jaguar commanded. The bloodied youth rose to his feet and, gazing out on the crowd, slowly raised a fist in the air. The villagers left from their seats with a universal roar. Viva! Wobbling on his stool, Chen struggled to rise as the world began to spin around the former teetotaler from Ho Cho Fo. Teetotaler, sorry. The last thing he remembered was somebody leading him off in the dark. So, same thing. First, like, drop your images that, like, were your, were the most striking to you in this one, the ones that really made you, like, oh, you know, made you react. 
Mine was um, Mass Armadillo. Yeah, why is that? What, what, what feels like resonant about that to you as you think about it? <laughs> it made me like, it, it disrupted me from listening to you. So all the images kind of do, um, but it kind of interrupted me listening. And I'm like, what would that look? Because I'm like, that, that must be a mask, but what would that look like, right? So it's like, I'm hearing this very vivid image and then I'm, my, my imagination is trying to place that. So I'm like, so what would that look like? Is this like Mortal Kombat? Is this like, I know it sounds funny, but I'm like, how would I, pe my imagination is trying to catch up. Um, so that's why. Yeah, did anybody else have that feeling of like your imagination trying to catch up? This is like a very densely lyrical poem compared to the other one even, right? It was just image after image. I remember the, the part with like the, the school turning into burning lace work. I was just like, wow, you know? Um, so I think part of what I wanted to, like, well, wait, let me first answer to the second question. How did, what are some words you can use to describe how you felt as you were listening to this passage, listening to this poem? It can be like one word answer, if that's fine. I love how several people mentioned the pink liquor. Yeah, that was really interesting. We'll talk about that in a sec. Okay, I'm overwhelmed, emotional, feel like a burst of color through images. What do you mean by that, Erin? Um, I think like, I think um, you mentioned before, just like it's um, like a really densely packed um, poem. Um, and I think um, not only are we sort of like getting like one image after another, but they're all sort of coming together and um, creating this like really, um, really richly colored scene. Yeah, right. Jessica said swept up, it kind of feels like the same vibe maybe like it just, yeah, I think that one thing that's really interesting about this is like, I feel like when I read poetry that feels that dense with images, it's a very different, like, you know, sorry, I mean like, we mean like um, non-narrative poetry. This is like, you know, the, one of the main things in this poem is like the narrative that's being unfolded. Um, and I think when I read things that are less narrative focused that have that many images, I kind of just none of them make sense anymore to me. Like they kind of all just kind of feel like they're they're adding like, the whole the color thing really resonated with me when you said because it feels like sometimes they just turn into like a sensation and not necessarily like literal information. You know what I mean? Like I think that the fact that he did that and then had it in the frame of a story that I was following was very interesting. And I, I get the overwhelm and like the eerie, you know, there's definitely kind of this sense of like things, you know, not quite being explained. Um, that are kind of dark, right? You know, they had this whole ritual that was kind of like a little scary, right? Um, yeah, I wanted to also bring to your attention like that the way this poet uses sound is so important to how this passes, how, how it is successful, right? There are so many like beautiful rhymes and alliterations in this passage. Um, like, um, like, you know, somebody mentioned the hurt bird, right? That's like, that's an internal rhyme that just like naturally kind of happens in the middle of a line. Um, you know, what is another one? Blue into a flute carved from bone. There are just these very like punchy, like metered, but not in like a predictable way, right? Lines that are really adding a lot of texture. And I think I kind of felt almost more grounded in the way that sound worked in this than imagery. I feel like the it was easier to focus on how it sounded, even as I was reading, than it was trying to follow the image system. Even though they, they weren't like unclear, right? It was just like, it almost felt like that was another course of logic in this poem for me. Um, so I'm gonna take a break to write and then kind of show you the third poem. So magical realism, right, is like we've been talking about, it's more of a device. It is genre associated, right, it's associated with fiction, but actually it's a device, right? It's like a thing that you can do in your writing. Does anyone like want like a stab at trying to like give a personal definition of magical realism? Like what does that mean for you when I say that? And or like, why do you think I framed this workshop around that concept, around this poetry book? So I can give like a, a personal definition of magical realism. I think that, I would say like magical realism for me, like it's like when a story or like a narrative rather, when a narrative like is seems to be grounded in a reality that's familiar and then also incorporates elements that would be usually associated with fantasy or fantastical things. So like the kid plunging his hand into his brother's chest and like then they, they he come back to life and like that's this whole like 
and it's and it's being offered as like that's what actually happened this is not an illusion it's not a performance um that is magical realism to me because like the rest of it kind of seems realistic to me right it's like they're drinking liquor they're in the jungle they they having a party or a bonfire and then there's this random element that nobody reacts to even though like if that happened in context that we're familiar with that would be like a miracle but they're kind of all like yeah this is what's supposed to happen right now um and you know things like when there's kind of like these elements of this that come into a tale that is being framed as like an account right this is being framed as something that he's translating from a from a document um there's an account of somebody's life and then it just incorporates nonchalantly these fantastical elements and says basically this is the story um that for me is kind of like magical realism constable house yeah that sounds cool too like, this, like i feel like the way i read constable is kind of like this like almost a w in there um that's why i talk about like you know everyone reads differently too because like i also just have like an accent so. um anyway yeah so i wanted to kind of bring up that concept and that device right so again magical realism is often associated with fiction um people writing stories that kind of just have elements that aren't explained they're expected to kind of ingest that part of the reality of the story um but there is being used in this poetry book too and i wanted to ask how do you think like, what do you think might be a benefit or like what kind of effects would adding that kind of element to an otherwise realistic story do? What do you think that does for a story? Um, I loved your definition of magical realism because I struggle so heavily with like explaining the genre, though I, explaining it though I like it. Um, I like to think of magical realism as incorporating magic in a way that is ordinary. Um, so as if it's an everyday thing. So sometimes when we walk into fantasy or like sci-fi and the audience, we have to suspend this belief because we know that this is not really real. Whereas with magical realism, there is no suspending disbelief. You're just accepting this reality with all of its possibilities. And magic exists just like someone with brown eyes exists. And I think it's useful because it can sometimes take extraordinary things and make them, I don't wanna say ordinary, but make them I guess ordinary, not the best explanation, but like peace and like a parallel reality where magic and fantas fantastical things are more everyday rather than fantastical, things, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me what you said. Um, thank you for adding that. Yeah, I think that I liked what you said about like suspension of disbelief versus just another way of telling the story. Like, you know, I don't, I don't, how did you phrase the other, you said suspension, suspension is like sci-fi versus what, how did you describe the other way? And when you're watching sci-fi, you have to suspend this belief in magical realism. You know, these fantastical magical things are incorporated as normally as someone with brown eyes right. or like, you know, getting on an elevator. Like they're just, they're a part of this reality. They're not something so hard to conceive um, that despite magic being present, magic is normal. Thank you. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so what would that, what kind, what does that add to a, to a narrative to use that approach instead of suspending disbelief, like you're saying? I think in, in particular in the second poem that you read, it just added some emotional resonance to it. You know, like the um, the first section where the twins uh, recovered the the main speaker. Um, you know, like you could tell that there was there's you know stuff going on in the background. There, you know, like there are horrors of war. There's like they're about to go on this journey, but it's all kind of um, off stage. And then when they have this very cathartic um, group ritual, like it, there's um, there's just, there was so many, there's so much more emotional resonance there. Like when he pulled the heart out and everyone's cheering, the school's coming down, the, uh, the constable's howling, you know, like there's just a lot, um, we're just experiencing a lot more than the, the dread of potential violence. 
yeah, I think that what you said about him, it adding a different kind of emotional resonance, I think, that, you know, that makes a lot of sense. And that kind of like, this is a, this is a, when this narrative comes up in the book, it does tend, it actually escalates in that, you know, in that element of the story, like it becomes more and more fantastical and then kind of like bows back a little bit. And then, and so like that kind of feels like an emotional arc that's happening um, in the manuscript as a whole with this section of it. Um, so I wanted to just kind of try and do the thing where you mimic what an author does for different reasons and see if it works with what you're writing. So we're gonna try to just like take on um, this form of not only magical realism, but like telling what's kind of being framed as like an account of someone else. So like um, to kind of try and see if we can explore what it feels like to write about someone else like this in a poetry context. So I'm gonna lead you through some prompts that'll kind of make that a manageable task for the next you know, 10, 20 minutes. Um, the first prompt is to write down the name of someone, uh, probably someone, but someone basically who you, like not gossip with, but you know, the person you call to be like, oh, this happened. Or like the person that you talk to when you wanna like get advice about something that's happening with somebody at work or at school. Is there somebody who you can think of who you would like call up or try to talk to you about like that kind of thing? And once you write that down, just, I guess, look at me or something or thumbs up or something. Okay, so the next part of this is to, sorry. Oh, just, I want you to think about the last time that you had, you had a conversation with this person and write down, I guess, if you had to summarize that conversation in five bullet points, it can be like, it can be like that kind of conversation, like that they're giving you the tea or you can be explaining tea with them, but just kind of write down, like summarize the last conversation y'all had in five bullet points. And if it wasn't like that kind of gossip, y'all talking about something else, that's fine too. Just write down, like summarize it in five bullet points. Take another like couple of seconds to finish the sentence you're on. All right, the next thing I want you to do is I want you to translate one of those um, lines. And here's what I want you to translate it into. I want you to, to basically sum up that line, one of those bullet points that you made, um, sum it up in nouns. So you can't use any verbs or like transitive anything no grammatical points, but nouns. So if, you're, if your bullet was like, I went to the store um, in my car and the cashier was trying to flirt, but I didn't, I wasn't into it. And then I, I need you to take all of the verbs out and replace them with a noun. So it can be something that feels like a noun that does that verb. So if, if for first I could put um, Libra, um, right? So I can just kind of, I want you to make a list of nouns for these bullet points. Do at least two, but um, get do as many as you can in the next, I'll, say, I'll give you two minutes for that. Don't think too much about it. Just kind of free associate nouns and just replace all the other um, words in that line. When you're done, could you give me an example in the chat of like one line that one bullet point that you replaced both the before and after? That way I know you're done.
keep working on those once we write if you want. But the last thing I want you to do, um, write down a place that has cultural significance for you. So that can be any time in history. It can be magical. It can be real. I could say Mansimus's kingdom. Anything. I was muted, I did it finally. So a lot of this book um, is concerned with like perspective shifts and um, how to understand like other other aspects of reality that aren't necessarily personal to somebody. Um, for example, like the professor kind of encounters students who um, are very contrary to his methods and he gets in these, he has these kind of, he has several points of like connection with students that feel tense um, and that are reflected in like ways that other characters in this book of poems have to give and like compromise. So he never directly addresses, you know, some of these interactions, but they show up in parallel ways, for example, in Chen's story. Um, so what I want you to do is kind of try to recontextualize one of these um, interactions that you had a conversation with your friend about or whoever your person in your life is. So whatever the conversation or like the anecdote or whatever that you kind of documented at the beginning of this, I want you to recontextualize it in the place that you um, wrote down. And I would like for you to use the nouns that we made as kind of like a word bank and incorporate at least half of them into like, well, not, let's just say three, incorporate three of them into your retelling of the story in this alternate place. So this is a challenge to both like include your setting in what you write and make it an active like part, um, this, this um, non-realistic setting, even if it's not, even if it's a place it wasn't realistic, it didn't happen there. Um, and then I also want you to include the words that you associated with the original, um, with the original text in your retelling of it. Does that make sense what I'm asking you to do? So basically I'm asking you to retell this, um, retell this anecdotal conversation, recontextualize it in a new place and use the words that you associated with it as like part of your inner system. Does it make sense now what I'm asking you to do? Okay. So take, take about five minutes and just like try to start writing this. And I'm gonna check in with you and see if you want more time after five. Does that sound good?
So go ahead and finish whatever line or sentence you are working on. And then turn on your camera so I know you're back. Um, as people are trickling back in, how did it feel to um, use generated nouns as part of your image system? Was that like something that felt intuitive for people or was that like a constraint that felt difficult? I'm just curious. Did not I think it definitely pushed me in different directions than maybe I would have gone um, had I not had those nouns. For me, it was helpful to think about the setting. I think like usually when I write, I forget about where we are. And it was, it was, it's um, forced me to, to incorporate that. Thank you. Yeah, that's like also a challenge for me. And I feel like some of the poetry that I read, I'm like, wow, this is like, I can tell exactly where I am. I never actually get there myself. So thank you for reflecting that too. So, um, I want to hear from one more person, then I want to ask people if they want to share um, what they've written. Um, oh, I was going to ask also, did anybody have a genre in mind when they were writing? Or did this feel more like a free write that didn't have that question involved? Again, I'm just curious. There's no right answer to this question. I feel like if you're at you, Capri. Yeah, I feel like sometimes I don't really. Yeah, is that? Yeah, I feel like that's that's how it felt for me too, which is interesting. Um, so did anybody want to share all or part of what they wrote? Nonfiction. So it felt like you were writing nonfiction as you were kind of as it's coming out of you. Yeah, I feel like it was very much based on the conversation that I picked a friend and it was very much based on that conversation so, how, so did that feel like did that structure make it easier or harder to incorporate this other setting you know i think it made it yeah it made it hard um yeah i can imagine like if you really if you really resonated with the fact that it was like a real thing that happened, I can imagine like having another setting would be make it difficult. Um, so did you did you or anybody else want to read um, part of what you wrote? You can also just read offer like a line or like an image if you don't want to like read. I don't like reading my work in words all sometimes. I can share. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um... We are lonely because we have no choice. Even the rain refuses us. At night, the desert cools like the heart of a dead horse on the road, mess of wild and asphalt. How to feel sorry for ourselves when we chose, when we chose to live here. No, we didn't make it this far into the hills to admit what we have missed beloved. I love that, that last line where the hills come, come into it. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, what, what, so what do you, what do y'all think? Like, let's like, do a little, can I put you in the spot for a second, Aaron? I just want to ask like people, like what, what felt like the primary, like kind of, what part of the language felt important or like in the forefront of this word? Did it feel like it was like the image system? Was it sound? Was it kind of just like tone or mood? Was it the speaker's persona? What do y'all think jumped out of you in terms of like, what was making this click? So I agree that it was gorgeous. I really felt like a lot of the different sounds and images added up to that feeling of refusal that the the narrator named at one point, but then it was, you know, like the, the rain is being refused, the asphalt is obviously kind of hostile and not friendly, and it just um, those images just kind of stacked up to add up to that feeling for me. Yeah, I feel that. Thank you. got about a minute left. Oh, also, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Jean, can I send you the link to the third one? I was gonna show them since we're out of time to look at it together. I wanted to show you this one because like, it's a very different structure. It's not really a prose poem. It's like actually like, it structures itself after like a questionnaire of sorts. And I wanted to show you like kind of how 
the same literary device shows up in that piece in the same book. A matter of fact, loneliness that wasn't actually familiar with me when I told him the part of loneliness that I was born. Oh yeah, you're talking about Aaron's uh, work, right? So I think that that was what got me was the tone. I was like, this is like really like very like it felt very nuanced, even though you just wrote it. And I was just like, wow, I was really struck by that too, Jessica. Um, but yeah, thank you for kind of trying this with me today. And I, I like I said, like if you got if you register for this, you should be get the email with the the link to the poem that I was going to show you next. But I hope that kind of like, you know, considering other elements that we don't necessarily associate with like free writing all the time, like setting, um, help kind of push you in a different direction. And remember that you can always do things like that word bank trick, like that can work for a lot of different situations. And like there are other ways to kind of like borrow from other genres tactics to kind of free write in a way that feels more free um, and unexpected. Um, so yeah, and also I do recommend this book. It, it's, it's great. I focus on one very small element of it. I don't know if this is why I felt kind of weird and misleading, but I do recommend it. And I'll link you to that too when I um, when, we, when I have Jean send out that email, okay? Thank you all so much for coming. This was really fun for me. I hope we had, had a good time too. Thank you so much. Thanks y'all. It was good Bye. meeting everyone. Thank you. Thank you, it was great. Cool. So I'm turning off my...